Good afternoon, everyone. It's our pleasure to be at the Upstate Medical Center today. Let me thank all the nurses and doctors here for their extraordinary work and what they've done. Uh, doctors and nurses from Upstate Medical Center made themselves available all across the state, and they were really fantastic. So we thank them all very much. It's a pleasure to be with Mayor Walsh and County Executive McMahon. Uh, I thank them for being here. I thank uh, President Dewan for his hospitality. We have with us today from my far right, Dr. Howard Zucker, our State Health Commissioner, who's been, been doing outstanding work. Uh, to my right, Michaela Kennedy Cuomo, youngest of my three. I thank her very much for being here. She was going to come with us yesterday, but she had an appointment with her pillow that could not be broken, despite an executive order. To my left, Secretary Melissa DeRosa. To her left, uh, Gareth Rhodes. The, uh, first, again, I want to thank all the nurses and doctors here and all across the state and the country who have done just Truly, truly extraordinary work. Uh, thank you for being with us this afternoon, this morning. I wanted to make sure I could watch the hearing that was going on in Washington to see if it, there was anything that we could learn. Uh, today is day 75. Feels like a lifetime, but it's 75 days since we had our first case. You can see so far so good in terms of the continuing decline in the total number of hospitalizations in the state. Uh, on the three-day rolling average also, the number of intubations is down, and that's really good news. The number of new cases, which is what we're watching, these are the new cases statewide, new diagnoses, people who are in hospitals who, who test positive or people who walk in the door who test positive. It's much, much better than it was. Uh, the number of lives lost is also down, still terrible and tragic, uh, but headed in the right direction. So all the arrows are pointed in the right direction. And we're basically uh, right back to where we were before we started this horrific situation. Uh, the question then becomes reopening. It's not a question of reopening or not. Uh, everybody wants to reopen. We have to get back to work. People need a paycheck. Uh, the state needs an economy. People have lives to live. So everybody wants to reopen. The question is how you reopen. And from the national experts, global experts, make sure you don't reopen too soon. What they mean to be saying by too soon is you have to reopen intelligently, and you have to reopen uh, in a calibrated way. Nobody says don't reopen. They say just be intelligent about the way you reopen. Uh, follow the data, follow the science, follow the facts, follow the metrics. We know enough now to know what happens, that every action has a reaction. If we do this, then this will happen. We've, we've lived this enough. Uh, so, based on what we know, make sure we're being intelligent, not emotional, not political, not based on feelings, but based on facts. And learn the lessons of other people who have gone through this. Other states have gone through it. Other countries have gone through it. There are experiences that we can learn from. Educate yourself. Uh, and be smart. Be smart. Check the data on a daily basis. And we have the data on a daily basis. We put together uh, a very elaborate reporting system on testing data, on hospital data from all across the state. That data is now available on a daily basis. And you can track that data and know exactly where you are. It's like taking your blood pressure every morning. It's like getting your cholesterol count every morning. You can know exactly where you are every morning. Uh, and not just for the elected officials, not just for government. This is uh, all about what people do. This is about what citizens do. 
And what the elected officials are trying to do, what I'm trying to do is to inform the citizens so they can better protect themselves and they know what decisions they should make. And that's why all the information we're accumulating, we're making it in a very transparent way. And I hope people get up in the morning, they have their cup of coffee and they go online to find out where their county is, how are they doing, and calibrate their behavior that way. Uh, the state has developed a very elaborate dashboard of relevant local information. Uh, they told me they were designing a dashboard. I got very excited about it. Uh, I sent them a picture of what I think is one of the really iconic dashboards, 1967 Corvette, arguably the most beautiful dashboard. I said they should consider that design when they were doing a state dashboard. They came back with this design. This is a New York State dashboard. How it in any way mirrors a dashboard from a 1967 Corvette, I have no idea, but uh, how can government be expected to have the same artistic design that we had 50 years ago? So here's the state dashboard. You notice the iconic design and curves and art that was used in it, but it has all the information, even if it's not the most artistic. Uh, and it has all the information for all the regions statewide, so every region can compare themselves to where other regions in this state. Right now, by the uh, criteria that we have, which is basically from the federal CDC, uh, we have certain regions that are poised to reopen tomorrow, uh, other regions where the numbers do not suggest they're in a position to reopen. And this is all based on the metrics and the numbers. How many hospitalizations do you have? Are the cases going up? Are they going down? Do you have your testing in place? Do you have your tra tracing in place? Uh, and obviously, we have different rates of infection across the state, hence the variance in opening times. The uh, big responsibility is now going to fall to local government to manage this situation. Uh, and uh, my advice to local governments are, uh, in terms of priority, daily monitoring of numbers. Daily monitoring of numbers and daily monitoring of numbers are the first three priorities, right? Know the facts, know what you're dealing with, uh, you know what activities you engage, you know how you increase the level of activity, we're measuring the effect of that activity. Make sure you monitor it every morning, every morning. Make sure the businesses that open are in compliance with the guidelines that are opening. Make sure individuals comply. You know, you're going to say it's a reopening. People are going to say, hallelujah, run out of their house. They're going to want to get out. They're going to want to do things. Uh, reopening phased reopening does not mean the problem has gone away. It means we have controlled the problem because of what we did and because of our individual responsibility and individual actions, and that has to be maintained. Uh, and I would urge local governments to be diligent about the business compliance and about individual compliance. Uh, and then if you see a change in those numbers, react immediately react immediately. If you allow this virus to get ahead of us, we will have a problem. So we'll have the data react immediately. At the same time, the states uh, need help from the federal government, and that's a topic that's being discussed now. Washington must act. It must be smart. It must be fast. New York State is a $61 billion hole. When you shut down the economy, you obviously create an economic whole for the state. Well, what does the state fund? The state funds local governments, funds schools, funds health care. If the state has no budget, then schools get cut, hospitals get cut, uh, local governments get cut. If local governments get cut, then you cut police and firefighters. Why would you ever want to cut essential frontline personnel at this time? Makes no sense. Washington has already acted. They've done a lot of business incentives. Great. But 
We need our health care institutions, we need our schools, we need our police and firefighters uh, funded. I spoke with President Trump this morning. We spoke again about the uh, state funding issues. Uh, he heard me out. I've also asked him to expedite certain payments, uh, and he's expedite, expediting a $3.9 billion payment to the uh, MTA, which is a very large transportation agency in the state, which desperately needs funding because the ridership is way down. Uh, and the president cut red tape and actually uh, sent the first installment today. So I'm grateful for that, and I thank him. Uh, the House, meantime, has proposed a bill. The bill does a lot of good. It funds state and local aid, $500 billion, to make up for those shortfalls. It funds testing. Everybody talks about testing, tracing, testing, tracing. Those operations have to be put in place, and New York State will wind up hiring thousands of tracers. We need funding to do that. I understand it's our obligation. States are in charge. Governors are in charge. But we need help with funding. Uh, and the House bill repeals uh, the SALT tax change that was made in Washington about three years ago. And that tax change that they made cost New York State billions. The House bill repeals that change, which is a significant, significant benefit to this state. And ironically, the states were, that were most hurt by SALT are the states that have the most pain from the COVID virus. So repealing SALT actually is, in my opinion, the best thing you can do to help the states that are now battling the COVID virus. In New York State, the SALT repeal increased our taxes 12 to $15 billion, just New York State. We now pay 12 to $15 billion more every year to the federal government, believe it or not. Uh, so that would be a major boost. But Washington has to act. No delay. No special interests uh, getting priority or special treatment here. And when we're doing these corporate bailouts, make sure we don't make the mistake we made in 2008 where we gave corporations large bailouts and the corporations took the money and paid themselves with the money. I was attorney general at the time. I brought cases against corporations that took the bailout and gave them all, themselves all a pay raise. Why should the American taxpayers now bail out corporations unless they're going to rehire workers? I'm afraid you're going to see corporations that will not hire back the same number of employees. They're going to use this pandemic as a way to restructure or get lean. If a corporation is going to take government money, they should rehire the same number of workers they had before. I did an uh, op-ed in the Washington Post to that effect. But I believe that should be a condition across the board. Any corporation that gets money from the government, from the people, should hire back the same number of workers. If you want to lay off workers, don't expect the taxpayer to subsidize you laying off workers. Uh, and if there's a moment in our modern history where we can get out of this partisan gridlock, uh, hyper-political moment, now is the time. Uh, my position of funding for state governments is not a democratic position. There's an organization called the National Governors Association. It's Democratic governors. It's Republican governors. The chairman is a Republican governor. I'm the vice chairman. Uh, and the NGA, National Governors Association, in a bipartisan way, is urging Washington to pass the relief for state and local government. So it's, there's no red or blue here, right? It's red, white, it's and blue. Uh, also, at the same time, we went through all this pain People talk about reopening. I don't want to just, I want to set the bar higher. It's not about just going back to where we were. Let's use this as a moment to grow and to get better. Let's learn from the pain that we went through. And I talk about reimagining New York. And let's use this as a moment to reimagine our education system, our telecommuting, our telemedicine, a better public transportation system, a better public health system. 
uh, and take this experience and grow from it, right? Uh, life will uh, knock you on your rear end. Uh, that's true. But do you get up, and do you get up smarter? And that's, that's the moment we're at. Uh, one of the lessons we learned, and I was speaking about it in the hearing today, we should never again be in the position where we don't have medical equipment, where we're facing a pandemic, we're facing a major public health issue, and we don't even have basic equipment for nurses and doctors, and so much of it came from China, and governors such as myself are trying to figure out who do we know in China to get masks for nurses in our hospitals. I mean, it was terrible what we went through. Uh, it's a matter of national security. And um, I want to make sure that we in New York are actually leading the way. Let us start manufacturing here in this country, in this state, masks and gowns and tr drugs and the ventilators and the tests we need. Uh, and let New York start, and we already have. But we should never again as a nation have to scramble the way we scrambled. Uh, we are now aggressively courting businesses incentivizing businesses to build, to manufacture medical equipment here in this state. Uh, and the state will partner with corporations to do that. So if you want to start, grow your business, expand your business, uh, manufacturing masks and gowns is not the most difficult uh, situation technologically. The volume is the problem, the quantity. But we want to develop that here in this state. Uh, and then with this virus, we must remain vigilant because we're still learning. Facts are in many ways still continuing to change on, on us. Uh, and while we're learning, uh, the virus is still learning also. We have a situation that is serious and concerning, which is these COVID-related illnesses in children. Uh, Department of Health is now looking at 110 cases of a COVID-related illness in children. It's similar to the what they call Kawasaki disease or toxic shock-like syndrome. We've lost a five-year-old, a seven-year-old, and an 18-year-old girl uh, to this disease. New York State and Department of Health are at the forefront nationally, if not internationally, in, in looking at this. Uh, and the Department of Health, good work of Dr. Zucker, they've had a number of uh, telephone conferences, uh, web conferences. 16 other states now see cases that they're investigating once uh, Department of Health uh, explained what they've been looking at. Six European countries are now looking at the same situation. Uh, and I expect this is only going to grow. Uh, parents should beware, and parents should be informed of this. Uh, the key is prolonged fever. Uh, and then you see on the chart the other uh, symptoms that parents should look for. Also, it tends to present in children who were exposed to the COVID virus and actually now have the antibodies from the COVID virus or still test positive for the COVID virus. So if you have a child who has a fever who you think may have been exposed to the COVID virus, a person who had the virus or, or you found out later came down with it, and you see these symptoms, uh, then you should take action. Uh, New York State has uh, published today online the first in the nation criteria for healthcare professionals to uh, isolate, define, identify this syndrome, and test for it. But it is uh, very important. Right now, we have it affecting children from less than one year old, uh, so infants to 21 years old. Okay, that's the that's it. Uh, when you look at over the 100 cases, that's the span, which is obviously a very uh, frightening uh, development. There's more information on the website. Last uh, point, 
point of personal opinion. I'm the governor of the state of New York, and I take that responsibility very seriously. I'm honored to be governor. I work at it seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Uh, but in many ways, before being governor, I am a son, I'm a brother, I'm an uncle, uh, and I'm a father. And uh, as, as a parent, as a father, I just want to make sure I'm communicating, especially this last situation, to the people of the state uh, and beyond. This virus has been ahead of us every step of the way. I can't tell you how many quote-unquote facts I was told that then changed, right? When the virus started, the virus was coming from China. Everybody was looking at China. Turns out the virus came from Europe, and uh, nobody told us. When this first started, if you had the disease and recovered, you then had antibodies, and you were immune. My brother had the virus, recovered, so he had the antibodies. We were told, well, then you're immune from getting it again. And we had plans to have people who tested for the antibodies. They could go back to work because they were immune. And the facts changed. You know what? Uh, maybe they're not immune, or maybe they're only a little immune, or they're partially immune. Then we were told uh, children are not affected by the virus. That was the only good news, by the way, in the whole first uh, evaluation. Children aren't affected. Okay, now maybe children are affected, and we just didn't know it. Okay, well, what do we know now? Well, we're studying 100 children from 1 to 21. Okay, Michaela, my daughter, is 22. Well, we only have people up until 21, so she's okay. Yeah, until we have someone who's 22, or 23, or 24. So the facts change. I have done my best to give people the information that I know. But I want you to have the same caution flag that I live with. The facts on this virus have changed, and I believe they will continue to change. So take this all with a grain of salt, and my basic point is do not underestimate this virus. It has beaten us at every turn, and it has surprised us at every turn. Don't take it lightly. Don't underestimate it. I believe the facts will change as we go forward. The more we learn about the virus, the more the facts change, and the worse it gets. There has been no news since we started this where we were, were actually uh, too cautious or too concerned. All the news has been bad, as far as I'm concerned. So with all this information, with all government is doing, hearings in Washington, all this, you know who's going to protect you? You are. You know who's going to protect Michaela, 22 years old? Michaela being informed. Michaela understanding. I like to think with a little advice from a parent, which she discounts 99%, but maybe 1% of the advice communicates. Michaela's graduating from college this year. They closed the college. She said, you know, a lot of people are having parties and they're having uh, graduation light events. Should I go? You know, 22, you can't tell them anything at 22. I couldn't tell them anything at 21, 20, 19. But I said, well, here's the facts. This is what we know. And is it worth, is it worth the risk to do it? And Michaela's made all the right decisions. But every parent, every child, it's your job to understand and protect yourself. And I just urge caution. Because everything I say, I tell you everything I know. But I'm also telling you, there are things we don't know yet. And how do you protect yourself from those things? Just be cautious, be diligent. Uh, 
wearing a mask, wearing gloves, uh, staying away from gatherings. I know they're inconvenient, but God forbid, you know, just God forbid. I've talked to too many families who have lost people. I've talked to too many families who lost people who were not supposed to be lost to this virus, right? This started, this was just about vulnerable people, senior citizens, comorbidities. Yeah, but then how do you lose a 40-year-old who had no symptom of anything, right? Children were not affected. Yeah, until children are affected. So, caution to everyone. And whatever I know, I will communicate. But again, it's about you protecting you, and I heartily recommend caution and diligence. Questions? Governor, the state website today posted um, what looks like guidelines, a breakdown of industries for phase one, and basically an agreement businesses have to fill out. Would you explain that process, speak to business owners across the reopen regions of the state about what they need to do? Yeah, let me give you the general outlines, uh, Melissa or Gareth, or Dr. Zucker, or Michaela uh, can chime in. The uh, phased reopening, phase one reopening for regions that hit certain numerical criteria. Uh, we talked about what regions are poised to hit that criteria tomorrow. And then with the phased reopening is construction jobs, manufacturing jobs, retail jobs, by these guidelines. Uh, and the guidelines are posted, and the guidelines are quite specific, social distancing, curbside pickup, in-store pickup, uh, if you're a manufacturing facility, uh, six feet, PPE provide to employees, et cetera. Those guidelines are then enforced and monitored by the local governments. To the extent there's any question for a specific business uh, that these guidelines don't exactly fit. How does this work? They can call the quote unquote regional control group, uh, mayor, county executive, their local county executive, because they're going to be in charge of the compliance. And we understand one size does not fit all. So depending on power of business, it may have to be customized. And how do I interpret six feet? This is how my business works. It doesn't really fit six feet. Uh, all those uh, one-off issues, if you will, uh, will be handled locally. We just have statewide overall guidelines. And any particular tailoring question, that should be done with the local government. You want to add anything? No, that's correct. And we posted it, as you noted, last night today. We're doing our regional control meetings with the state to be able to answer questions of all the local leaders that will then get passed down to the businesses. Is there a backside to the process? Does the state or a local control group have to approve these filled out agreements by the businesses? This is the way that they demonstrate that they're adhering to the overall guidelines and then it can be a check on the business afterwards. You said that this is the way you're gonna maintain social distancing, that you're gonna create a safe environment for your workers. And then if there's an issue on the back end, then you have the plan that they said that they were gonna adhere to and it's a way to hold them accountable. Okay. Last weekend, we've had about a week to prepare for reopening, and the phased approach is mostly for businesses and things like that. We're getting a lot of questions from people about social acceptability. Since we've demonstrated that we can be responsible and keep our infection rates down, is there any leeway from a social aspect? Can people go to their grandkids' house if they keep their distance? Um, it seems like a lot of people are desperate for some social interaction. Yeah, look, there is, there was never a law on social interactions, right? Uh, how I interact with Michaela is, is my business. I could have gone, uh, I passed Matilda's law. Matilda's named for uh, my mother. Uh, I have not seen my mother since this started, uh, except on video devices. The, I could have, that's up to me. You know, this is your relationship, it's your interaction, it's your family, it's your friend. You know, that's, we have guidelines, we have best practices, we can tell you what we think is smart, but that's up to individuals. And uh, that's why I say, inform yourself. I, I suggest caution, again, because this virus has only gotten worse, the more we know. But 
there's no law or regulation that tells you how to interact uh, with your personal relationships. That's up to you. I hope you do it smartly, but that's up to you. So how do you think about people tomorrow when they wake up and they're in phase one? The uh, businesses that choose to open, big question is how many, how many businesses, big question to me is how many businesses choose to open uh, tomorrow, but you know it, for those businesses that choose to open, this is how retail stores will work, curbside pickup or in-store pickup, and then you can get the details on that. Manufacturing companies that want to open, this is how their employees, uh, the PPE their employees would have to get, this is how it would have to look in the workplace, no gathering, social distancing, etc. Uh, and then we watch the numbers tomorrow, and we see with that increase of activity, how did people behave? And what was the effect on the infection rate? And then we go day to day. Governor, religious leaders, a lot of them I've talked to are feeling left out um, because they're not mentioned anywhere in your four-phase plan. Now, while you didn't specifically close churches, I think a lot of them are looking for guidance. Um, what can you offer to churches, temples, mosques, as far as guidance for when they can start to reopen? No, the, the, it's less about being a church, a temple, or a mosque. It's more about a gathering. Uh, and that's going to be basically uh, according to the guidance on large gatherings. But look, large gatherings have been where this first started. You know, we had the first quote unquote hot spot. Before they even called it a hot spot, we had the first big cluster in New Rochelle in Westchester. Uh, there was no reason for it to be in New Rochelle and Westchester, suburban community. It was because one infected person went to a couple of events around a religious ceremony. But the last thing you want is 100, 200 people in close proximity. That is the last thing you want. That's why schools are such a challenge. How do you operate a school without a gathering. But that's what that's the issue on the churches, temples, mosques. So it has nothing to do with religion. It's the gathering. In regards, in regards to the Madison County outbreak at Green Empire Farms, more than half of the workers have tested positive, some living poor to a hotel room. One worker just lost her husband to the virus. And the company isn't answering our questions. Are you getting answers and what are you doing to protect the community and the workers? Yeah. The there are a number of outbreaks across the country in meat processing plants, right? So all these stories, this meat processing plant, this meat processing plant. Then we had an outbreak in an agricultural plant. Well, what was it about meat processing? It had nothing to do with meat processing. And by the way, it had nothing to do with agricultural processing. It was the fact that you had 1,000 employees in one plant. It is the gathering issue. But they, they call a super spreader. One person in a large gathering, any density, can infect dozens. That was New Rochelle and Westchester. Literally dozens in one event in one gathering. That's what we learned in New Rochelle, that's what they learned again in the meat project processing plants. That's what we just learned again in Madison County. So it is about the gatherings. Uh, now, they have several hundred employees in one place. Yeah, one infected person, it can take off on you. That's why all the precautions. Uh, four people in one home, yeah. What we're seeing now with a lot of the new cases, they're coming from home spread. Right? Close down businesses, close down schools, etc. So where is it now uh, communicating and growing? In the home environment. Madison County said that the facility wasn't able to continue construction of its housing for these workers, so they then put them in hotels. So the coronavirus displaced their project, therefore they had to live in hotels. Kind of a full cycle of why the density was the way it was. Well, if you have four people to a hotel room or four people to a home, you know, it's going to be the same thing. It's, uh, you have one infected person in the home, you see it go through the family, 
right? Should something have been done differently, though, if they don't have places to stay, not put them in a hotel? Well, you have to, people have to live somewhere. But it's, it's not unusual to go through a family. Uh, my brother Chris had the virus. His wife got the virus, probably from Chris, though he denies it. But then his son got the virus. Why? Because they're all in the same place. Dr. Zucker, do you want to add anything on I that? I think it's just, I would just add that we have been working with the, the county to address the housing arrangements uh, and working with the employer. Will you hold them accountable if they, the company, you find out the company hasn't been? We, we are investigating everything, yes. Governor, a question for you about. Do you know anything? No, I was just going to add that this speaks to the whole reopening process, right? This is why it's so critically important that we're measuring on a daily basis the infection rate, the hospitalization rate, that we have proper testing, that we have proper tra contact tracing in place. Because if you look at the Madison County example, there's one instance and then there's an explosion of cases in one area. And you need to be able to test to find out whether or not those people are sick. You then need to be able to isolate them. You need to be able to contact trace to find out who else they interacted with or else we go back to square one and I think we can all agree no one wants to live through this again. So it just underscores the importance of doing this reopening process smartly of every employer who's got starting to reopen or is currently open, doing this in a way where social distancing is properly done, where we're making sure that everyone's wearing masks, where they're wearing gloves if that's possible, and that we do this smartly and we do it the right way. Yeah, and one of, one of the points to learn from Madison County, I think, you know, it's too easy for people to say, in more rural communities, well, this is not our problem, right? This is a city problem. This is an urban problem. This is New York and Detroit, New York City, Detroit, it's Michigan, it's Chicago. Uh, no, it's Madison County, which is a rural county. You open a plant, you open a business, you go to a gathering, you have one person infected. One person infected, they can infect dozens in one afternoon. One afternoon. I don't care if you're a rural community, suburban community, urban community. Nobody is immune. That's what Madison County says. That's what these meat processing plants in middle America say. In rural communities, one person. You open a business tomorrow with 50 employees. You don't do it right. One person was infected. You can infect 30 of the 50 in one afternoon. As businesses begin to reopen in phase one, two, whatever, is there a liability if there is an outbreak at those businesses, and should that be waived? The, uh, we, there's federal legislation that is now pending that's going to deal with this liability issue all across the board. Uh, but it is a big question. I, if I'm advising the business owners, I say make sure you take all the required uh, guidance and you follow the guidance. Um, and the guidance is quite specific. So I would urge that they all do that. No, I'm, and part of the business reopening plan, as you're mm -hmm. noting, is something that you have to turn in to attest to the fact that you are adhering to the guidelines. And so if businesses aren't doing that, to the governor's point, I think that they do that at their own peril. Let's take one more. Someone who didn't ask a question. Sir? Surgery centers, eye doctors, dentists. What phase do they fall in? A lot of people are asking when they can go get their eye checked for maybe for a driver's license, toothache, whatever. Dentists, eye doctors, surgery centers. What phase do they fall in? The uh, just so you know, driver's licenses, et cetera, You cannot be. You can do transactions for the Department of Motor Vehicles at a web on a website. For the in-person transactions at a Department of Motor Vehicles, which are basically license renewal where you need an eye test, uh, something like that, those deadlines have all been suspended. So if your license expires or if your vehicle registration expires and you had to go into the DMV, uh, no one is going to enforce those laws until you can go into the DMV. So we suspended that. The elective surgeries uh, in um, many counties upstate have all restarted. The doctor's appointments, uh, doctor's offices op are operating, can operate with social distancing. Ambulatory services are open. You know, people who need medical attention or medical treatment should go get it, right? Governor, 
at the state fair, you've already said what has to happen regionally for that kind of event to be held. But with the Syracuse Nationals coming before that at the fairgrounds, and then the state fair needing to be planned, what's your confidence level that the status of this virus will be in check for those events to be held? Yeah, I'm, I am not going to guess, and all it would be would be a guess, and I'm not going to do that. This situation changes every two weeks. Uh, and that's why I'm, I want to do this caution and I want people to hear me because I don't want them to say, well, the governor said, which I did say, I said, we don't believe children are affected by this virus. I said that. I said that a number of times. And uh, I'm talking to the best public health experts on the globe, and that's what they told me, and that's what I told people. And now that turns out not to be true. I'm very wary of that, right? And I take that responsibility very seriously, because when I say it's a fact, I present it as a fact, and a fact is a fact. What's happening here are facts are changing. So to say Here's what I think is going to happen in five weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. This is where I think we are going to be in September for schools. No, burn me once. Uh, I'm not going to guess. I'm not going to opine. We'll make the decisions when we have to make the decisions because for planning purposes, et cetera. But uh, let's see what the facts are at the last minute that we have to make a decision for the Syracuse National or State Well, Department. they have to tell me when their drop dead date is, you know, that I would have to know by this date. I'm under the impression for the Syracuse Nationals that's tomorrow. Well, they haven't communicated that to us, but, uh, you know, give me the drop dead date and I'll, I'll make a decision based on those facts at that time. And then if they change, they change. But I want, I want to make sure we're using the best information we have and we are in a situation where the information keeps changing. And look, there can be positive information also, right? There could be a, a medical breakthrough and they announce that they found a therapeutic model that actually treats the virus. So there can be good things that, that have developed, uh, that develop also. Just hasn't happened yet, well, but there could be. One housekeeping question, 1201 Friday morning or 1201 Saturday morning is when a, a re region can reopen. 1201 Friday morning, the 15th. Is when New York on pause so expires. Friday can be a day of business. Yep. There's a lot of confusion among professions that aren't in phase one about which phases they're in. Hairstylists, professions like that, they think they're phase two. Do you have an idea of when you might have a firm list of which professions are in which phase? I hadn't heard that question, but we can do that. Do you see hairstylists as phase two? Uh, I don't know that I'm qualified to opine on that. Unless you're saying I, I need a haircut really badly and then we'll talk about it. But we'll get the information. We also will have daily calls with the Regional Control Council. Uh, the mayor and the county executive are here today. Uh, and a lot of this is going to be locally managed. So uh, we'll be working with them. But, you know, the state, one of the, the beauties of the state, it's a little, we have 10 different regions. Each one is a little different, right? Uh, so each one of these situations has to be tailored to that community in that region. Uh, and that's why the county executives and the mayor are going to be so important in actually making it work in each region. And we'll be working together with them. So it's possible that different professions could be in different Well, places. no, a hairstylist is going to be a hairstylist is going to be a hairstylist. I just don't know where a hairstylist falls. So I'm going to gracefully and artfully look to dodge your question on hairstylists until I can go back and get informed, and then I will have someone give you the answer. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. In-person DMV, is that phase one or two? I'm sorry? In-person DMV services? Phase that's one. not a phase. That's when uh, we make a decision on which government agencies to open when. And we'll have a full list of the professions Hairstylist included, uh, and what phases they're in. Camps and playgrounds and dance lessons. The same thing. They'll all be. They go by region. Camps go by regions. So 
that's their decision? To, uh, members of Congress, Republican members of Congress from New York calling for an investigation into the nursing home situation in New York? Look, you know, everybody, I would like to say that we are enlightened enough where this is going to be a period where we don't play gratuitous politics. Uh, but everybody makes their own decision. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Good to see you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.